Okay, uh, welcome to today's episode of uh, Monsterology, and uh, today we're going to be discussing uh, vampires, desire, and parasites. And this is a topic that I think, um, well, the 20th century is filled with uh, wonderful vampires, probably the most um, noteworthy of which is Dracula. But of course, in the last, um, I'd say 20 years, certainly in the last 10 years, there's been a proliferation of sort of young adult um, vampire narratives, uh, lots of books, graphic novels, and movies. So today we're going to look at the idea of the vampire historically, philosophically, uh, in terms of issues like gender, sexuality, desire generally. And um, let's start with just some like obvious uh, definitions. And this I uh, take from the Oxford English Dictionary. Uh, vampire is defined there as a preternatural being of a malignant nature uh, in the original and usual form of the belief, a reanimated corpse. So it's very common for this to be a kind of zombie that drinks blood, but the zombie and the, and the vampire narrative have really, I think, uh, disentangled from each other and are quite different now. Anyway, to go on with the, with the uh, definition, the, these are supposed to seek nourishment or do harm by sucking the blood of sleeping persons, a man or woman abnormally endowed with similar habits. So in general, uh, vampires hunt at night since sunlight weakens or kills them, and some have the ability to change into a bat or a wolf, and they have super strength as well as hypnotic and sensual effects on their victims. Usually they cannot be seen in a mirror. So, all right, that's a uh, fairly common definition of the vampire. You can see uh, right away that the reference to animals like bats have clear um, roots in actual zoological knowledge. Uh, there are vampire bats that drink blood. It is common for animals to, uh, certain kinds of predators to drink blood. Blood is extremely uh, nutritious for predators. Uh, so it's not a complete accident that uh, this uh, sort of super predator is a blood drinker. I thought we'd start with a list of some fairly popular, well-known, or influential books, and the same with cinema and television, just to get that out there uh, and up front so that when we get the, philo the philosophical material, we'll have a sense of uh, some of these great sort of cultural uh, icons or works. In terms of books, uh, many people will mark uh, 1819 as the start of the modern uh, vampire uh, tradition. And that's John Polidori's uh, book, The Vampire. Very influential on all of the horror writers that came after. You'll notice that the date is right around the same time as uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, so there's a kind of there's a gothic sensibility. A lot of times, the sort of early 19th century, all, all, really all through the 19th century, is oftentimes considered to be a gothic period in literature. You have kind of different forms of romanticism in literature, uh, which are sort of a break and a move away from the Enlightenment, faith and reason, and instead the romantic uh, novels and stories celebrate the emotional and the irrational and the frightening. So some romantic literature will be very, fairly positive and po you know, optimistic, and some of it will be very pessimistic and dark, and that's the kind of work that you see happening in Polidori and eventually in people like uh, Edgar Allan Poe. But after The Vampire in 1819, you get uh, uh, Joseph, Joseph Sheridan Le Fanu's uh, novel, uh, little novella, really, Carmilla. Carmilla is written in 1872, and Le Fanu is a, a really great writer from this period. Uh, his stuff is surprisingly modern. If you read his material, it, it's really shocking that it it's, uh, goes back to the 1870s because some features of it feel very modern in terms of the psychology of the characters. And we'll talk about Carmilla again later. It's actually, it appears to be a um, coded lesbian narrative as well, and so that's always attracted attention and uh, made it a fairly significant work. Bram Stoker's Dracula, I think, is probably the best known of these, 1897. We'll talk a little more about that later. Richard Matheson's uh, 1950s uh, book, I Am Legend, is very well known, uh, in part because it's kind of a blending of the traditional vampire narrative with science fiction uh, of the 1950s and then some wonderful sort of 
film versions of this have been made. Uh, I think many people are, are aware of I Am Legend uh, with uh, Will Smith, but then there's a great um, sort of a movie from the 1970s with Charlton Heston, uh, also based on I Am Legend. Uh, Stephen King's Salem Lot, you see I'm moving through this sort of chronologically and you get a sense that each one of these uh, famous books was really drawing on the books that went before it. Uh, Salem's Lot was one of King's earliest books, 1975, uh, and it, it was also made into some television versions too. Um, then in the late 70s and the 80s, Anne Rice wrote a series of novels called, um, starting with Interview with the Vampire, which was uh, 1976, but then eventually these became taken together as the Chronicle, Vampire Chronicles and she's been writing them for the last few decades, really. These were extremely influential in bringing the vampire back into popular culture and also a certain kind of vampire, which is this more elegant, refined uh, character. It, that, that character is there at the beginning, but Anne Rice really celebrates it. And then finally, uh, Stephanie Meyer's uh, Twilight Saga, which I know many people are familiar with. That's a series of books and then movies uh, from uh, 2005 to 2008. Let's look at the uh, cinema and television. Here too, uh, the vampire is articulated uh, beautifully and um, memorably, but also there's some wonderful larger aesthetic issues. For example, Nosferatu in 1922, and then Dracula, the Universal film in 1931. These really have some strong tie to the expressionist films and the arts movement of expressionism in the early 20th century. Um, Dracula had a huge influence then on subsequent films like um, Dracula in 1958, which was made by Hammer Studios in England. The Hammer Studio made many horror films in the, um, starting in the 50s and all the way up through, I think the late 70s, maybe as far as the early 80s, I'm not sure. Uh, but those were also very famous for different uh, reasons and with a different aesthetic. Uh, Dark Shadows was a soap opera, very famous, from 1966 to 71, which put a vampire right at the heart of a long-standing uh, soap opera, so right into the living rooms of mainstream bourgeoisie America. Uh, then Buffy the Vampire Slayer from 97 to 2003, also extremely influential, in large part, not just because of the way it, it, it sort of portrayed vampires, but also the way it portrayed, the way it it brought in gender questions to uh, horror, traditional horror narratives. In 2008, there was a thoroughly frightening film called Let the Right One In, uh, which um, is a European film, which was also, of course, remade in Hollywood. And then there was the Twilight film series, then True Blood on HBO from 2008 to 2014, and then um, more recently, The Vampire Diaries on the CW from 2009 to 2017. 2017. This is by no means an exhaustive list of uh, television and film. Uh, there's so many graphic novels, games, fan fiction, and every year some new set of um, shows is, is created. I simply want to show how uh, important and powerful the vampire uh, monster has been in culture, particularly in the 20th century. So let's talk a little bit about the history. Uh, Bram Stoker probably named his character Count Dracula after Vlad Dracul, or Dracula, also known as Vla Vlad the Impaler. And uh, Vlad is an interesting character. Vlad was born in Transylvania, Romania. He ruled uh, Wallachia, Romania from 1456 to 1462. And he had a reputation for cruelty but he was respected by Romanians for fighting off the Ottoman Empire. So he was considered a, a strong and powerful uh, force of protection against what um, Romanians saw was an always, an always encroaching um, threat from the Ottoman Empire. His nickname came from his favorite method of killing enemies, which was impaling them on wooden stakes. And some stories suggest that Vlad Dracula uh, enjoyed dining amidst his dying victims and dipping his bread in their blood. Uh, I don't know whether there's truth to this, but honestly, uh, I'm not inclined to doubt it. Uh, in, in the sense that I'm, I'm the kind of person that thinks, um, I think it was uh, 
the philosopher, um, not Montague, but Montaigne, who said there's nothing that human beings won't do. Uh, there's nothing really foreign or alien to us, and uh, that includes kinds of behavior. Um, Bram Stoker appropriated elements of Vlad's legend as Count Dracula, uh, and it was also said, who, Drac Count Dracula was said to be from Transylvania, and he sucked his victim's blood and could be killed by a kind of impaling or driving a stake through the heart. So here in this slide, I've got an image of Vlad uh, dining here with his uh, enemies uh, impaled next to him, and that's a portrait of Vlad the Impaler, uh, <laughs> which has some of the wonderful qualities that I think Dracula will have also in the 19th and 20th century. The kind of aristocratic quality, the, the kind of Eastern European ethnicity, the uh, mysterious Orientalism of it all, very common in uh, vampire literature. Uh, all right, so let's look at some um, history here in the United States of vampirism. And we, I'm just gonna mention this one uh, sort of famous uh, set of cases in New England. Everyone knows about the New England, um, the witch trials. Uh, but I think the vampire panic is not as well known, and it's definitely worth our, our time here. Uh, throughout the 1800s in New England, tuberculosis killed many people, and no one knew what caused it. I mean, you have to remember, this is a time when uh, medical knowledge was very rudimentary. So most people infected with the bacteria that cause tuberculosis don't have symptoms. However, when symptoms do occur, they usually include cough, sometimes blood-tinged coughing, Weight, weight loss, which can be severe, night sweats, and fever. Eventually, people just wither away. Uh, and this uh, disease was called consumption at the time. Superstition held that the disease consumption, or tuberculosis, was a consuming of the victim by the victim's undead relatives. So vampire relatives were to blame, basically. Like, uh, it was thought that if you were wasting away from tuberculosis, there must be somebody in your immediate family who is basically undead and is feasting on your blood and pulling the life force out of you. So when a person began to waste away with the disease, people dug up the graves of their family members and they decapitated them. Uh, just like we have this tradition of decapitating zombies and putting a stake through the heart of um, vampires, it was common to also decapitate vampires. I think you see this in, uh, again, in that early vampire literature, including Le Fanu's um, Carmilla. So what's uh, kind of disturbing about this is uh, this case in 1892, Mercy Brown. If you see in the slide here, I've, I grabbed a, a photograph of her grave um, in Exeter, Rhode Island and people still make pilgrimages to her. Those of you who are big vampire fans may take a road trip there, and people will leave uh, little, you know, mementos there uh, for uh, Mercy Brown. And so the story is this. In 1892, Mercy Brown of Exeter, Rhode Island, died at age 19 of consumption. Uh, many relatives in her family also died of the disease, which is pretty, you know, natural because the it's a contagious disease and family members it would spread through families easily. Uh, this led some in the community to theorize that Mercy was a vampire. When they exhumed her body, they found that she had not decomposed, or not much anyway, and that she still had blood in her heart. Now, the explanation for this is probably simpler, which is that she, she before she was buried, she laid in the freezing cold uh, for, for the winter. Um, but before they could basically break ground on a grave. So the argument that many have is that, of course, she's not going to be decomposed because she was essentially frozen solid. Um, her heart and liver, however, were then removed and burned. Uh, a medicinal potion was made from the ashes of her heart and liver and given to her brother Edwin, who was struggling to survive his own bout with the disease. He died two months later. So this goes to show you that as late as 1892, which is honestly not that long ago, people were literally digging up uh, d dead bodies, decapitating them, burning their hearts, drinking the ashes of their hearts, all as a way to fight off what they thought was vampire activity 
and was in fact just tuberculosis. Um, the uh, Mononongol, uh, Mononongol is a tradition of uh, the vampire in the Philippines. And while I think many other cultures have uh, vampires, I wanted to just tell you this one because I think it's so unique and interesting. Uh, the Mononongol is described as uh, a totally hideous and frightening female. Um, and this creature is able to sort of sever uh, its upper torso and like from its lower, from its legs. So it splits in half and then it sprouts these huge bat-like wings and it can fly around looking for victims. In fact, the word Mononongol comes from the Tagalog word, which means to remove or to separate. So uh, it literally translates as re sort of remover or separator. Uh, and this is somebody who separates themselves into these two horrifying parts. Um, the creature is basically uh, uh, really fond of preying on sleeping pregnant women, and it has this elongated proboscis-like tongue to suck the hearts of the fetuses um, or the blood of someone who's sleeping. It, it haunts newlyweds or couples in love, and it um, it's also has a way of going after um, any, any grooms who were going to get married but, they, but who ran off um, or left the altar place. Uh, the, the, if you are hunting these things, then uh, the legend is that if you find its the lower torso standing there waiting for its upper torso to return uh, before sort of sunrise, what you do is you sprinkle salt and crushed garlic on the top of the standing torso. And that's fatal because um, what happens when the upper half returns to rejoin with the lower half before sunrise, it can't rejoin because of the garlic and the salt. And this causes it to basically get uh, caught in a sunrise and burned and, uh, and killed. So this is just a, a really uh, fascinating alternative tradition of the vampire it has some of the same features of, of the Western version and some really fascinating um, sort of uh, idiosyncratic uh, aspects as well. All right, so let's look at uh, illness, contagion, and folk medicine as a way to start to get into uh, what led to, to these kinds of th ways of thinking. What, what does it really mean? And uh, there's a number of theories here. One is that uh, the vampire cultural tradition is built on top of um, medical concerns and phenomena of pre-scientific uh, cultures. Without scientific understanding of tuberculosis for, tuberculosis, for example, it was easy to make supersti superstitious claims about blood-drinking vampires. So other similar diseases uh, influence the traditions. If we look at this on the left-hand side, we look at something like the plague and in the medieval period and through the Renaissance and into the modern period, you had the bubonic plague. The plague leaves bleeding mouth sores. So it was common to find somebody suffering from the plague who had blood sort of coming out of their mouths. And some people have suggested that that was part of the, the, the development of the legend. And then porphyria is a blood disorder which causes severe blistering of skin, which is exposed to the sun. And sufferers of porphyria are irritated by garlic which is, has a high sulfur content. So this is an interesting correlation. Uh, here you have somebody who is really burned by just sunlight and um, they can't stand garlic. So you can see again, some of the elements of the vampire coming together in what are really uh, truly unfortunate, uh, you know, human diseases or maladies. Uh, rabies and goiter were sometimes also ascribed to vampirism. Rabies is, makes you really insane and almost zombie-like and kills you. And the goiter is sort of a develop, a growth on the neck. And of course, sexually transmitted diseases and the general sort of fears about bodily fluids were probably very confusing to, to pre-scientific peoples. Um, that's clearly one of the aspects of the vampire um, legend is some kind of relationship with sexuality. Some people have taken blood to be a kind of stand-in or a coded a representation of semen and a lot of this is happening at night when people are sleeping and being victimized and also of course there's there's romance in many of the vampire stories 
So some have suggested that it's a kind of coded way in which the culture is wrestling with questions of sexually transmitted diseases. One should be careful, you know, about where one's bodily fluids go. And so perhaps uh, culturally mandated fears around uh, bod bodily fluids uh, would have been sort of transmitted uh, and passed around in the culture. All right. Um, and then we've already talked about consumption or tuberculosis as another perhaps uh, medical um, cause of uh, vampire culture. Look over here on the right-hand side of this slide. Here you'll see that uh, I'm going to talk just a little bit about folk culture wisdom and gene culture coevolution. Um, many people think about evolution as being uh, genetic uh, variation and then natural selection uh, basically selects for certain genetic variations and against others, and those genes then spread through the population. However, uh, a more sophisticated view is the gene culture uh, coevolution theory, um, and uh, this holds that culture also contains within it very adaptive um, beliefs, activities, and traditions. And these will get spread and transmitted through the culture in such a way that they help the, the group and the individual survive. And so all, not all adaptations are genetic, some of them are cultural. Now let's take a look at some issues here around vampires. Well, we know that garlic, which a lot of traditions think uh, fights off vampires, we know that garlic is a strong natural antibiotic, and if used properly, it can kill many infections. So before the invention of modern antibiotics, garlic was a common medicine. Uh, this is, I think the contemporary uh, holistic health movement knows this, and you've probably heard this before, you should eat garlic, and you should maybe take garlic pills, and there's tinctures of garlic and so forth. That stuff's not completely uh, baseless. It's based on, uh, some of the real uh, antibacterial properties of uh, sort of garlic chemistry. And so um, diallyl sulfide, a compound, a compound in garlic, uh, was found to be 100 times more effective than two popular antibiotics in fighting uh, Campylobacter bacterium. Uh, and that's uh, a study according to the Journal of uh, Antimicrobial Chemotherapy. This bacterium is one of the most common causes of intestinal infections. And uh, Dr. Xiaonan Lu from uh, Washington State University said, quote, this work is very exciting to me because it shows that this compound has the potential to reduce disease-causing bacteria in the environment and in the food supply. And then I include down here for you the title of a book. If you're interested in following this out more, check out Joseph Heinrich's, uh, uh, Henrik's uh, 2016 book, The Secret of Our Success, How Culture is Driving Human Evolution, Domesticating Our Species and Making Us Smarter. It's an excellent empirical study from many different cultures about how certain kinds of wisdom is contained within the culture that can help the culture. But here's the rub. The culture doesn't understand why. In other words, um, people knew to use garlic because it worked, but they had no particular theory as to why it worked. They had no access to modern chemistry. They couldn't understand the chemical sort of aspects or compounds in these substances. They simply had a correlation between, you know, eating garlic and surviving, uh, eating garlic and getting more healthy. And these kinds of things get uh, replicated in the culture. All you have to do is remember the correlation. And if you pass that on from shaman or medicine man or, um, you know, uh, maybe a midwife, down to uh, um, the next generation, then the culture can survive well. But it, if you ask it, well, how do you know how to get well or why does garlic work? It has no theory as to why it works. It's simply the replication of habitual correlations. I find this very exciting because um, I think it's probably how most culture works. Like most of us, in fact, um, even in a scientific culture, we take it on faith that um, our certain kinds of behaviors are going to be good for us, and then we follow them habitually. So I just refer you to that literature. It's kind of fun with regard to monsters because it shows you that fighting off monsters might also be based in uh, what I would call these, these folk wisdom traditions that were tried and tested. All right. Um,
So let's talk just briefly about blood as life force and its relationship to appetite. Um, you know that before science arose, we had a kind of pre-scientific view of how the body worked, which was based on the four humors. Um, and this is basically blood, uh, yellow bile, mucus, and black bile. The, the view from the ancient tradition all the way up until really the 19th century, well, I suppose the 18th century, um, was that you and I and all human beings, really all, all uh, mammals, were made up of these four humors. And the reason they thought why you got sick was because you had an excess of one humor rather than another. So blood is a humor, bile is a humor. If for some reason you've got too much yellow bile in your system, then you're gonna get sick. You're also gonna be a certain kind of person. There's, we've talked about this before. There are character traits assigned to some of these supposedly physiological uh, theories. Um, here are some images on the left-hand side of the slide of physicians or barbers, which were really the same thing in those days, bleeding people in order to improve their health. The idea was, oh, you must have too much blood. Let's remove some of your blood, either with leeches or by cutting and draining, and that could improve your health uh, tremendously. So these were superstitions in a way, but they were kind of somewhere between full-on superstition and, and science. They were sort of pre-science uh, examples of folk wisdom. Uh, the image on the right-hand side is interesting because it shows some of the character, character traits of people who have an excess. Uh, it was common, for example, uh, for people who had an excess of blood um, or a dominance of blood in their harmony, uh, they were thought to be sanguine, which meant they had a lot of energy and lust for life and uh, were sort of positive, whereas yellow bile uh, led to a kind of angry person. Um, high degrees of mucus were, were sort of uh, slow, lethargic, and uh, high degrees of black bile led to depression, made you sort of uh, uh, really just can't get out of bed. And these are, of course, naive. On the other hand, um, there's something to the idea that um, if your blood is not uh, healthy, strong, or, um, or you have enough of it, so to speak, you're not gonna have life energy. You're not gonna have appetite, drive, uh, conatus, or, or striving. And this, of course, in medicine now, we know that it, you can have anemia, where you don't have enough red blood cells, for example. And so you have to think about the, the vampire tradition in this context, where people are um, losing their life force, getting sick and getting weaker and weaker. And the argument was, well, they're losing blood. And the vampire argument was somebody is stealing their life force, not just their blood, but actually by taking this ingredient from another person, uh, this precious internal ingredient, the vampire is able to actually keep living and achieve a kind of immortality. So you're basically adding up the life force of other things, and that's a common theme in vampire literature. All right, um, let's talk just for a minute about some of the cognitive issues. Um, a cognitive science evolutionary psychologist, Matthias Claussen, wrote a piece uh, about why Dracula continues to be an interesting and common character in the 20, in 20th century and 21st century uh, literature and film. And uh, he noticed that Dracula is a, is a great example of a sort of a hyper predator. And by studying this literature, we get a better sense of what kind of creatures can prey on us if we're not careful. So it's a cautionary tale to us to stay away from certain kinds of creatures. Now, I find this interesting because um, it's true that once we left the state of nature and we're no, we're no longer living on the, on the plains, so to speak, and fighting big cats and you know snakes, the, really the main predator of human beings is other human beings. All you have to do is open your newspaper or look at your news feed on your phone and you will find that the vast majority of people are being killed by other human beings. Dracula is an interesting coded version of a hyper predator. Not somebody who's gonna run up on you in an aggressive way, but somebody who's slick and smooth and basically is going to take your life or your life force slowly and um, without sort of conscience and without empathy.
So it's sort of a coded way of talking about human relationships. We should be careful about this kind of person. Uh, strangers who maybe we don't know well, uh, maybe they're trying to ease their way into our lives for nefarious reasons. Uh, the other thing that is worth mentioning is the idea then of parasites as predators. Human beings have lots of parasites within them, as do, other, as do every uh, other animal. And um, it's not just things like uh, viruses, like COVID-19, but also living creatures that are multicellular are living within us. And what's interesting about the, Dra the sort of Dracula and the vampire narrative is that it's a kind of predator, but it, it, um, it feeds on the host too, too long and to such an extent that it actually kills the host. So it's a parasite that becomes a predator. Most parasites want to live in some kind of, you know, unsteady, but some kind of balanced relationship with the host because they need the host in order to survive themselves. In the case of the vampire, it uses you up and then discards you to find another one. That is sort of common in both parasite and predator um, biology. And then there's some discussion there, uh, too, about the undead as a counterintuitive meme. We've talked about this before. Uh, many monsters uh, have these sort of interesting cognitive um, qualities where you've blended together two categories. You know, whether it's a hybrid ant creature, like um, part, part animal, part wolf, part man, or whether it's really violating larger categories like living things and dead things, you blend those two together and you get the undead, which is something like a, like a, a zombie, or in this case, it's also the vampire, because the vampire was once living like you and I, but has transitioned into the kind of creature that cannot die. But it did go through a death at some point, so it is technically undead. All right, let's talk about um, some of the theories then um, by Ananya Mukherjee, who writes about um, more recent vampire narratives and gender relationships and romance. And she, she's she got a fairly interesting thesis, a number of ideas here, and I want to go through these just because I think she's onto something, certainly uh, onto, onto the latest um, examples of vampire films and television. Um, I think she's sort of isolating something interesting there regarding gender. Uh, and relationships. Let me just quote her to begin with. My thesis is that many of the vampire romances that have become so popular in the 21st century so far, especially the ones aimed at a young adult readership, presents us with old school gentleman vampires who are certainly sensitive and evolved in some ways, but who also offer the security and stability of old fashioned gentlemen that some readers may now crave without being able to clearly articulate that craving. All right, what's she saying here? Um, she's looking primarily at the kinds of, of vampire narratives that emerged during the millennial period, from say 2000 up to the present. And there she thinks she spotted something in the Twilight series, both in the novels and the films, for example, that is, she says, simultaneously of the past, because a lot of these uh, vampires really are characterized as gentlemen, and um, they're refined, they're educated, um, they're, they're guys, they're people you want to spend time with, but also they convey something about the future, which is feminine independence and, and autonomy. Obviously, you know, from the, the empowerment of women generally, you know, depending on where you want to take that beginning, um, it, women in the late 20th and early 20th century have far more choices independence and freedoms than women of previous eras. Um, obviously, we're not all the way there yet, and we have a long way to go in terms of uh, economic parity and so forth. But the, the point that uh, Mukherjee is, is making is that women no longer need any kind of reliance upon um, husbands um, or fathers in order to survive once they get to a certain age. We live in an economy um, and a culture where women can live and thrive and be free and actualize their potential uh, without dependence on, on, on males. And uh, what this causes, Mukherjee is arguing, is a weird sort of combination of um, there's sort of an old school uh, expectation, she thinks, 
uh, of finding someone that can quote unquote take care of you or protect you or be a partner that is in some sense reliable and you know if you need violence uh, to protect you then they're there to do that. I mean let's sort of think about this in terms of um, pair bonding. Human beings have been pair bonding really for um, hundreds of thousands of years, possibly even uh, a million years. And so the division of labor has traditionally been males do a certain kind of work and human females do another kind of work, both extremely valuable and important to the survival of the species. For example, males traditionally hunt. Why is this? Uh, human beings have what's called sexual dimorphism, which means that males are on balance, statistically speaking, 30% larger than females are. That's the same kind of thing you see in chimpanzees, for example. And so the biologists tell us that the reason for this is because males have certain kinds of activities like hunting, defense, and in particular, uh, fighting each other for access to females. That's why chimps are larger uh, than, f uh, male chimps are larger than females. Interestingly, uh, this is confirmed even by looking at bonobo primates, another very close cousin of ours, where the sexual dimorphism is not the same. Males and females are much more similar in terms of their body size and muscle mass, and that's because it's not a division of labor in that traditional way, where males are fighting each other for access to females. It's much more of a matriarchy or even egalitarianism uh, than, say, chimps are or gorillas are. And so one argument is that um, the traditional relationship between males and females in our prehistory was that males protected family through violence and um, females were the nurturers and caretakers of not just the offspring, but they were also in really the crucial ingredient for the survival of the group because they did all of the digging for um, underground nutrition storage like tubers. Uh, so men hunted for meat, but women basically got all the carbohydrates um, and that was the sort of division of labor that was, uh, we think, very successful for hunters and gatherers. And that held sway for, as I say, probably a million years until the rise of, of agriculture and then things changed. So the argument that Mukherjee is saying is girls want boyfriends that are traditional men, protectors, um, reliable, strong, but also they don't want any part of that at the same time and want total independence and to be um, on their own without sort of dependence for, on males. And so then Mukherjee says, well, there's sort of a tradition of the bad boy in vampire narratives. So the idea of vampire boyfriends um, really fills a lot of this more recent literature and film. And she says, quote, the dominant message in most vampire romances, however, remains a valorization of first loves, an elevation of teenage ardor and teenage desirability, and the notion that loving a very good young woman can save, can save even an extremely bad man. So you see this over and over again. The, the, the man is interested uh, in forming the relationship uh, and for, for all kinds of reasons. The woman is beautiful, uh, she's attractive, she represents youth, um, and sexuality, it would then be uh, accessible if he can woo her. On the other hand, the female is drawn to the quote-unquote bad boy because um, he's exciting, dangerous, and um, sa savable. Like, uh, it's oftentimes a common narrative in these stories that uh, the bad boy can be turned from his sort of selfish, uh, egoistic, and hedonistic ways to settle down with the right woman if she uh, has just the right touch or, or um, uh, skill set with him. The same is true, by the way, for, for the femme fatales. It's just that the vampire narratives traditionally have been um, masculine. Not, not always the case, and we're going to see in Carmilla that that's not the case. Uh, then Mukherjee says, quote, passionate love and sexual exploration come laced with a subtext of potential harm. It is the vampire boyfriend who enforces restraint and responsibility and protects the heroine's innocence for as long as possible, who acts as father figure as well as lover, desiring the woman but also policing that desire. So it is common in some of these uh, more recent vampire stories for the the female and the male to be 
very attracted to each other, to want to have sex, to want to, to merge and be a couple. Um, and the coded, there's sort of a coded version here too, which is the, the, the vampire male wants to drink the blood of the female, uh, which is, could be a surrogate for sexual uh, consummation. But oftentimes is such a gentleman and loves her so much that, that he's willing to forgo the sexual uh, um, intimacy and forgo drinking the blood because he doesn't want to curse her with his own curse, which is turning her into a vampire. And a lot of these stories, as you well know, play back and forth with this dynamic. Um, so you have a kind of romantic anti-hero, and the question is how, does, how do we deal with uh, this person you know, in intimate relation. So let's look at gender idealism in vampire culture. Uh, she makes a couple of other interesting points here and then we'll move on. This will be our last, I think, uh, uh, sort of discussion of Mukherjee, but it's a really interesting article. Uh, fantasizing the perfect relationship. I mean, everybody does this. Let's maybe pause for a moment. Um, all human beings, because of our big neocortical brains, have the ability to fantasize and imagine the kind of future we want, and that includes the kind of partner that we want. So here are some of the generalizations that she makes about male-female heterosexual relations easily uh, sort of translates to any sort of uh, partnership. Um, and I suppose, you know, this is not necessarily dyadic uh, partnerships, but also uh, polyamory as well. So it's easily extended. All right, let's look at this quote then on the left-hand side. If the contemporary heterosexual woman finds herself flummoxed in the face of all the various roles, often at odds with each other, that she must play, for example, professional, partner, mother, never aging vixen, moral leader, etc., then it only makes sense that her fantasized mate must also negotiate a highly convoluted personality. Vampire boyfriends are noteworthy for their extraordinary ability to be all things at once, embodying masculine ideals from multiple classes and eras, from multiple age groups and subcultures, offering an array of characteristics and abilities from which their human girlfriends, or reader proxies, can choose as they grow and develop themselves. So I think this is a really wonderful point she's making about um, and this is sort of a disaster for actual relationships too, is because you fantasize and idealize your partner to such a high degree that you expect them to be all of these things for you when no one can really satisfy all of those things for you. It's just, it's just impossible. Um, and this leads to all kinds of friction and disappointment and resentment that builds up within relationships. I think it's fun that she's identified modern vampire literature and films as a way in which young people are doing this fantasizing for, for good or, and for ill uh, in both cases. Um, on the right hand side, uh, another sort of meditation that she makes has to do with the new man. And this is an interesting development. Um, if you think about masculinity, uh, th obviously the masculine properties have been um, celebrated um, in certain cultures that are, for example, uh, bellicose, uh, warring cultures, cultures uh, of um, so soldiers and warriors will celebrate certain kinds of aggressive tendencies in, in males. On the other hand, when you have different cultural values, aggression gets demoted or devalued. And so there's, this has been happening in Western culture in a very strong way over the last well, I don't, I don't know where you would want to mark it. I, I leave it to you as to where you would mark it, but certainly even in the last decade, it's become stronger than ever, which is, um, is you know, masculinity intrinsically toxic? This is one sort of argument that, that's off, sometimes proffered on the far left. Um, or is it the case that there are certain properties within masculinity which are toxic and which could be educable and changed or, or is there no such thing as toxic, toxicity and masculinity and it's not an issue, it's com completely imagined. I think it's hard sell to, on the last one uh, because let's just fully admit that the vast majority of violence committed in the world is committed, is committed by males. Um, and that's true not just of homicide but war and um, 
sexual assault and so forth. I mean, there's something about men, uh, arguably, it's uh, the way they're socialized, but also from the biological point of view, it may have a lot to do with the, the sort of presence of high, high levels of testosterone mixed with the way in which it's uh, culturated and, uh, and sort of um, uh, characterized in, in the sort of narratological culture. But the new man uh, is fully aware of this. Like if you grow up in the US, you become aware that your own masculinity is in question and that uh, there's certain tendencies of masculinity which have been uh, I think um, in some cases rightly and I think in some cases uh, overblown uh, they've been demonized themselves so there's a sort of a tension then she notices it in the boyfriend as well the boyfriend's view the vampire boyfriend says I wish I wasn't a vampire and, uh, and I don't want to make you into a vampire either. And I, I hate myself and loathe myself as a result of this. Let's look at her quote here on the, on the right-hand side of the slide. The vampire boyfriend's almost ubiquitous dissatisfaction with his own vampire nature might actually represent the dissatisfaction that many heterosexually involved women would like to see their male partner feel about their own gender dominance and the ways in which they benefit from unfair sexist social system. So what is she saying? This is basically the debate about toxic masculinity. The, it's oftentimes the case, she's arguing, that young uh, female um, readers uh, of this literature want a boyfriend that is both strong and um, reliable and loyal and can do things, but also is um, apologetic about his own masculinity and his own um, history or implication with uh, the patriarchy. So there is this, and we see this in race uh, as well too, which is a question about what should one's attitude be towards one's whiteness, let's say. Is it the case that one uh, should be um, sort of confessing and noting and demoting one's privilege uh, and that sort of thing. So, so you see this also in gender relations and also uh, manifesting in a lot of what you know, might otherwise be thought of as just entertaining you know, monster stories. So I like the argument by Mukherjee. I don't agree with all of it. Maybe you don't agree with it, but it's a wonderful way of thinking about uh, even shows we're watching on cable television or graphic novels through the lens of gender relations. So it raises this larger question then about liberal or conservative values in vampire narratives. And um, this is the last quote from Mukherjee. She says, the great popularity of this genre suggests that many female readers are seeking certainty and protection and to maximize their options as women without curtailing feminine pleasures, a desire that is definitely worth acknowledging and addressing. And so this raises this question about sex and power relations. What kind of sex are we interested in as a culture what are the forms of sex that we think are quote unquote deviant? What are the forms that are dangerous? How should we approach it as, as you know, young people growing up? How should older generations uh, train and educate younger people about sexuality? And a lot of this stuff is bound up in the vampire stories. So one question is, should sex be completely separated from power? Like it should be egalitarianism? where both parties are totally equal. Well, yes, of course, if we're talking about consent, that's just a given. We acknowledge that both parties have to be completely consenting. But then there's the other question, which is in the sexual activity itself, is one expected to sort of be uh, extremely polite, respectful, and constantly in a kind of um, sort of uh, cost-benefit negotiation? And that is oftentimes thought to be the ideal form of sexuality in our official culture. But one of the things you see happening in um, sadomasochistic traditions and uh, the sort of literature that you find like um, Fifty Shades of Grey is that people even in sort of bourgeois culture are very interested in other forms of sexuality uh, having to do with bondage and pain and stuff that's not supposed to be on the menu you know, when you're ta taught about sexuality as a kid, well, you know, as a, as a teen or whatever it is, and yet um, we're starting to realize, hey, people have an appetite for this. 
And of course, people realized this a long time ago. Freud argued that um, heterosexual, you know, missionary sexuality is really just one of the things that people are interested in, and we should broaden the menu, so to speak, and people would be happier and less repressed and less neurotic if we did that. Uh, I think we're living in an era when it's finally happening in certain cultures, like our own. It's, uh, it's happening in fits and starts, uh, and perhaps not as fast as you want it to, but it's certainly better than it was for your parents and your grandparents. So that raises questions about dominance and submission within sexuality itself. And the psychoanalytic aspects I just mentioned of, of Freud held that people had uh, a lot more homosexual tendencies than they were allowed to admit, certainly in the 19th and early 20th century. But also, he said, people have an interesting blend of aggression and uh, affection. And lust is not just a sort of um, friendly, <laughs> you know, feel good experience that's totally empathic. It also has aspects of aggression within it too. And so Freud was arguing this way back when, and now we're finding that in terms of neuroscience, there's some truth to this as well. We're understanding the sort of neurochemistry of sexuality, the sexual activity is different from the bonding intimacy. For example, uh, very strong spikes in vasopressin um, and testosterone during sexual, um, uh, during the sort of hunt of sexuality and during the, the pursuit of sex and the sexual act. But immediately afterwards, there's a huge flood of oxytocin. And those are very different neurochemicals, different feelings, and that bonds people together. So all of this is in play because the vampire is a sexually attractive creature and represents um, sort of forbidden sexual freedoms. So here I just included images from, you know, from the Vampire Chronicles. I think you've got a young and uh, very hammy looking uh, uh, Tom Cruise and Brad Pitt here, and then just uh, randomly found some uh, sort of beautiful vampires here on the right. Uh, so all of this is in play. Uh, within queer perspectives, uh, certain kinds of attractions to the vampire, to monsters generally and to vampires in particular. Uh, Carmela, as I mentioned to you before, written in the 1800s by La Fanu, is a wonderful uh, vampire story on the face of it, but also, if you just want to read some erotically charged lesbian literature from a time when that kind of stuff was forbidden to be written, then Carmilla is a good choice for you. It's really kind of, uh, it works on all these different levels and it's, it's, uh, it's one of the things that um, people in the queer community who could not express themselves um, sort of honestly and authentically in a prejudicial culture, nonetheless found ways in which to code their deep values and their beliefs and their, their life ways uh, into cultural narratives that could, that could go unseen or undetected by the straight you know, society, but could be seen, detected, and celebrated by others like themselves. Um, if we look here, the homoerotic overtones in Anne Rice's series, The Vampire Chronicles, uh, are well known. Scholar James Keller suggests that there is a widely recognized parallel between the queer and the vampire. And here's just some images I found. Uh, Rocky Horror Picture Show is obviously a long-standing uh, marriage of horror and, uh, and sort of uh, the queer theory and, and queer studies and, and queer ways of being. And then a wonderful image here, an etching from the original Carmilla uh, publication that has just va vaguely veiled lesbian connotations. Here comes the guy discovering two women, one sleeping and another approaching. Also, look at how they're rendered. The sleeping uh, female is sexualized um, in obvious ways. So this is the kind of stuff that uh, is worth uh, keeping an eye on. Um, let's just mention then the last couple of vampire codings, ethnicity and class. Um, it's very common for uh, vampires to be Eastern European. Dracula is a good example, but oftentimes they're sort of coded with connotative references to Eastern Europe, Transylvania, Romania. Some scholars have pointed out that there are fears about immigration uh, 
Dracula demonizes Eastern Europeans? That's sort of an interesting question. And is oftentimes sort of crops up in these kind of invasion narratives, like these strangers are coming from another place and they're very dangerous. They have these ways that we don't understand and you know, they're gonna drink your blood. Uh, in addition to that, um, it looks like many of the vampire um, narratives seem to be coded anti-Semitism. Oftentimes they're characterized visually in the pictorial tradition as, ha as having sort of stereotypical Jewish um, uh, sort of physiognomies and sort of backgrounds and belief systems. They're among, it's, you know, if you look at the, the history of anti-Semitism in the West, it's a strange relationship because it's not like the Western demonization of Muslims, for example, which until quite recently, the West had very little contact with, particularly places like England and the US. In the case of anti-Semitism in Europe, um, places, anti-Semitism is different because um, the Jewish community in Europe, for example, was always there and just sort of separated, as we've talked about this before, sort of ghettoized in areas and contained, in, depending on how the politics of the time held sway. So the, for Western uh, dominant sort of paradigms of Christianity, uh, Jewish people were considered to be the foreign aliens among us. So that also contributed to sort of Jewish hatred and anti-Semitism. And that's the sad, uh, that, those are sad facts that led to a great deal of violence. So sometimes the vampire, it has been argued, has been coded, a coded form of anti-Semitism. In terms of class, it's interesting. Uh, vampires tend to be aristocratic. It's very different from like uh, zombies. So here's a list of things uh, on the right-hand side. They have an air of worldliness and sophistication. They are charming and seductive. Uh, the male vampires are slightly effeminate. They are older, but not too old. They are alone. If they have a companion, it is never another vampire, always a subservient human under the vampire's thrall. They have vast wealth of unknown provenance and they are immortal. So it's interesting that they're frequently characterized as attractive, beautiful, rich, and that's a very interesting key as, as well. Last thing I wanna just mention, and then we'll wrap up, is that many of the vampire narratives are very concerned with the price of immortality and thinking about immortality. So you'll see this, uh, it's a very common feature of Anne Rice's uh, interview with the vampire, sort of the original book of the Chronicles. Uh, the What We Do in the Dark um, in the, is a comedy spoof of vampire life and they play with this idea a lot. Many of the narratives, as you know, talk about what is it like to live for centuries and centuries. And even, and so it, it captures a paradox. We want to be immortal, we want to be young, we want to be beautiful. Hey, if we gotta drink people's blood to do that, okay. You know, this is sort of the bargain. But also the price to be paid for immortality is you actually lose the features of humanity that many of us recognize as the most meaningful thing. For example, you will outlive everyone you love. You will have a hard time eventually after eons and centuries having strong connections of any kind or bonds. Also, you kind of do everything. It's not like, oh, I mean, if you've lived for centuries, there is no finite terminus or boundary on your life to give it meaning. So there's a deep malaise an ennui, an existential angst or dread connected with this idea of immortality. And so a lot of times the vampire narratives are playing with that as well, and it's a really a fun feature of the, of the stories. All right, so that's enough for today, and I think you've got a good sense of vampires, desire, and parasites. All right, take care.